Hello and welcome to our fourth installment of the Founders of Our Liberty series. And today I want us to look at the Ten Commandments, or in other words, a moral law for a nation. And I want us to first of all talk about jurisdiction. In the scripture, the Bible records that there are four very specific points, if you will, uh, or spheres of jurisdiction. First of all, there's the jurisdiction of the individual. Second is the family. Third is the civil government. And fourth, the church. And it is within these spheres of jurisdiction that we see uh, the application of different types of law that we see mapped out throughout the scripture, and particularly the moral law that we find in the Ten Commandments. It's really kind of a fascinating look that in the framing of the wording of the Declaration of Independence, our founding fathers actually recorded a reference to the Ten Commandments. When people think, well, you know, is the Ten Commandments really something America ought to be about? Uh, you know, there's been a push for the last several years to remove the Ten Commandments from government buildings. But I do want to say, first of all, it is never the uh, obligation and should never be the obligation of the government to perpetuate Christianity. Jesus never told the government to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus told the church to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And there became this separation, not of church and state of the argument that we find ourselves in many times, but this other idea of jurisdiction where there's a civil government and where there is the church. And whereas a civil government has a responsibility, so does the church. So you and I as individuals, have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to one another. We see that this all began when God created Adam and God created Adam and then Eve. And then the second sphere of jurisdiction was created when God had Adam and Eve bear children. When all of a sudden the population began to increase, we saw the family born. And so there's jurisdiction within the family. And then as the populations and societies continue to grow and to develop, God instituted a civil code so that they would be able to relate to one another and be able to take care of the welfare of one another. And then from that, in the New Testament, we see the birth from Jesus Christ of the church, which was to continue to perpetuate the moral law, the moral order within society, that we were to take the gospel, sharing the, the, the lordship of Jesus Christ, sharing the word of God to the world. And that is our responsibility. All the while, the civil government keeping order within the nation or within the society. That's the reason why Jesus was very clear to, to say, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. But our founding fathers realized that if there was going to be a nation, a nation like no other, which is what they were wanting to see happen as visionaries, not dreamers, but as visionaries. They wanted to see a nation that was unlike any that had ever existed on planet Earth. And with that, they instituted in the wording of the Declaration of Independence a framework reference to the Ten Commandments. In the wording of the Declaration of Independence, it opens with, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political strands which have connected them one to another, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate but equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. There's the reference. And of nature and nature's God. There is a reference there to the Ten Commandments, that there is a moral order, a moral law that should be established within a society. If we go further in Scripture, in the book of Exodus, and we read the Ten Commandments, what we find is God developing for the Jewish people a ceremonial law of how they were to have a, a worship relationship with him. There was also the moral law of how men would relate to one another. There was the, the judicial law, which would talk about how the... Um, the government is responding, the structure of government, you'd, that was much further developed out in the, in the books of Moses. And then the social compact law, which is really those kinds of laws that were, whereas the moral law is absolute truth, absolute right and wrong, you see that the social compact law is relative right and wrong. And some people say, well, what's the difference? Are you saying truth is relative? 
Well, absolutely not. What moral law says is murder is wrong. It is wrong regardless. It is absolutely wrong. But social compact law would be something like the speed limit, where it may be 70 miles per hour in one place, may be just fine, but it needs to be 50 miles an hour in another place. It is, it is very circumstantial. So it's very relative in its uh, parameter. So that's a kind of a big difference between moral law and social compact law. What we're beginning to see today is that moral law is wanting to be replaced culturally by a more social compact law type idea, is that even the absolutes that we see in moral law have been reduced to becoming very relative and very flexible. And we see that that gets us into a lot of uh, very precarious situations. Our founding fathers knew that would happen. Our founding fathers knew that in order for the nation to establish and to be successful, not only you know generations beyond them, generations that had never been born, uh, they realized that what it would take to make that nation successful would be an adherence to moral law. And so it's our responsibility today as Christians to see the connection between the Ten Commandments and, and our founding fathers and how our nation uh, viewed the existence of the Ten Commandments and what that meant for not only the establishment of the nation, but the furtherance of the nation. Because first of all, the moral law, which is what we're really going to look at, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of a nation, is it encompasses uh, God's declaration. This is God's word. This is himself speaking, God's declaration on what types of behavior are morally acceptable to him. And like we said, moral law is an absolute right or absolute wrong. It's interesting that in the very early days of the nation, uh, Justice Chief Justice uh, John Jay, of course, we've talked about him before, one of our founding fathers. This is what he had to say about moral law. He says the moral or natural law was given by the sovereign of the universe to all mankind. With them, it was existing at the same time as man, and with them, it will be coexistent. He's so lasting as long as man exists, being founded by infinite wisdom and goodness on essential right, which never varies, it can require no amendment or alteration. So what Chief Justice John Jay said was that moral law is absolute. He would further write, the gospel not only recognizes the whole moral law and extends and perfects our knowledge of it, but it also enjoins on all mankind the observance of it being ordained by a legislator or infinite wisdom and rectitude and in whom there is no variableness, according to James 1.17. It must be free from imperfection and therefore never has nor ever will require amendment or alteration. Hence, I conclude that the moral law is exactly the same now that it has been before the flood. Founding Father Noah Webster agreed when he said, the moral precepts are of perpetual obligation. And so we see, even see throughout the New Testament, there's an affirmation of the moral law. There's some, some will take the theological view that the moral law, the Ten Commandments, belongs in the Old Testament, and it has no application in the New Testament. Well, that, my personal opinion, that's, that's ridiculous. Because how in the New Testament, when there are... Uh, Get words given by Christ about moral absolutes, where did they originate? They originate from the Ten Commandments. Um, so I, you cannot draw a line of separation between the Old Testament and New Testament and say that uh, the, no, the Old Testament no longer applies. Um, I know there was a pastor a number of years ago who made a reference that the Old Testament is not for the church today. Well, that's absolute lunacy. I mean, the fact of the matter is the whole counsel of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is exactly what the church needs. And I believe the church maybe needs to spend a little bit more time back in the Old Testament to see how God worked with people and seeing God's grace and his providence so that we uh, appreciate what Christ did and what we are, and we appreciate what is revealed to us by Christ and through the Holy Spirit in uh, the New Testament. But the moral law uh, of the scripture is set forth by God himself. And that really became the basis of what the Western world or refers to as common law. Um, and the, the idea of common law was actually incorporated into the United States Constitution in the Seventh Amendment. So when we look at it from a historical perspective, the Ten Commandments have always been viewed as the embodiment of the moral law from the very foundation of our nation. 
Uh, John Witherspoon, uh, one of our signers of the Declaration of Independence, wrote, the Ten Commandments are the sum of the moral law. So they realize that. That's the reason why there's that reference within the Declaration of Independence itself, the law of nature and of nature's God. We're going to be looking at that further in just a minute. Noah Webster also agreed and said that the moral law is summarily contained in the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God on two tablets of stone and delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai. William Penn, who was a, a lawyer from Pennsylvania and Delaware, he declared that civil magistrates should draw upon the Ten Commandments or moral law. John Quincy Adams said, Vain indeed would be the search among the writings of profane antiquity, or what is referred to in our language today, secular history, to find so broad, so complete, and so solid a basis for morality as the Decalogue lays down. Of course, you know the Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. So we see that, that by uh, lawyers and theologians alike coming into the foundational fabric of our nation was this idea that the moral, a moral law was necessary and that moral law was already had already been created by God himself. It already existed. The nation did not have to create a moral code. There was already one in place, and that was the Ten Commandments. So the moral law acknowledged at the Declaration of Independence as this laws of nature and of nature's God. William Blackstone, who was a political authority during the founding era, he explained the meaning of these two phrases. And I'm going to read this to you because I think this is pretty neat. That it, the laws of nature and the laws of nature God, or the laws of revelation. He wrote, man considered as a creature must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator. For he is entirely a dependent being. And consequently, as man depends absolutely upon his maker for everything, it is necessary that he should in all points conform to his maker's will. This will of his maker is called the law of nature. This law of nature being coeval or coexistent with mankind and dictated by God himself is, of course, superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over all the globe, in all countries, and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. The doctrine thus delivered we call the revealed of divine law, and they are to be found only in the Holy Scriptures. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, or that is the law of nature's God, depend all, hum depend all human laws. That is to say, no human laws should be suffered to contradict these. You know, this goes back to the very beginning of our series when we talked about the Word of God and our Founding Fathers. There was no separation in their mind between what God's Word said and the establishment of the nation. Even those who were not overly religious, even those that were deistic, even those that didn't even believe in Jesus, understood that the Word of God, that the Bible held the precepts necessary for what would be this new, this new uh, idea, this this new America, this new United States of America, that would be a bastion, a beacon, a lighthouse, if you will, of liberty and freedom uh, to the world. John Locke, also one of our founding fathers, put it this way: He said, "The law of nature stands as an eternal rule to all men, legislators as well as others." The rules that they, speaking of legislators, make for other men's actions must be conformable to the law of nature. For example, to the will of God. He said human laws must be made according to the general laws of nature and without contradiction to any positive law of scripture. Otherwise, they are ill-made. So he said any subsequent law should be made based upon the moral law upon the, the law of nature and of nature's God. So the law that God established, the law that God revealed was to be the very beginning of all things. My, how as a nation, we have strayed so far from that because now we look at we're looking at laws based upon just man's interpretation. We're, we're, the Bible is becoming further and further and further away from the, the uh, basis of any decision making. And that's the reason why we see both both major parties, Democrats and Republicans, both. They they sway like trees in the wind.
because they're going after consensus. They're going after public opinion and not based upon the word of God. And already here, John Locke said any laws of, that were not ba based upon the structure of the law of scripture, they're going to be ill made. And we find ourselves in quite that pickle today because God reveals himself both through what he has made in nature and also through what appears in his written word. So we see our founding fathers realized that there had to be as a nation a reliance upon the moral order, a moral law, and that that was found in the Ten Commandments. So that's kind of a fascinating uh, look at this. So in summary, the ceremonial law uh, that we see in the Ten Commandments really uh, pertain to the temple regulation, sacrifices, temple worship, all those things. Those were all parts of the, 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 there were the Ten Commandments. There are also the laws and the statutes that were given by God to Moses. In that was the ceremonial law. The judicial law uh, stipulates civil penalties attached to the uh, violation of God's established right and wrong. Social compact, we said those were enacted by, you know, enacted by society uh, to provide order. But there's the moral law. But the moral law identifies, and listen to this, timeless, unchangeable, and universal rules of right and wrong. Blackstone put it this way, the eternal, immutable laws of good and evil to which the creator himself in all his dispensations confirms. So we see a major word there from our founding fathers about the role of the moral law. So when we begin to hear articles, you read articles and you hear, you know, a lot of speak out there about finding your truth and living your truth. We have to realize that as Christians, we have an obligation to, in our lives at least, to hold to the moral law that God has given us. And Jesus says the encapsulation of all the Ten Commandments was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And what that does that takes care of the horizontal relationship, love your neighbor as yourself. But it also takes care of the vertical relationship, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Isn't that neat? It just perfect. It, it makes a cross, doesn't it? And it really is at that crossroads is where we find ourselves today. Do we love our neighbor as ourself? And do we love the Lord with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength? That's the question I leave with you today. Today, I want you to remember our founding fathers realized that the Ten Commandments, the word of God itself, was nature's law. And it was given, nature's law was revealed by God. And the law of nature's, God entitled them, that is the doctrine, the word of God given by God himself. Our nation was founded upon those things. And may we as Christians continue always to remind ourselves to stay steady in those. And we need to support men and women who, who are in forms of government that support those uh, standings. Not that we should expect the government to ever establish religion or to ever take over the responsibility to take the gospels to the, end, to the gospel to the end of the earth. But what we are to do is to let men and women who want to love the Lord their God with all their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength and love their neighbor, their self. And our democracy will, and, and our nation will continue to move forward in freedom and liberty that generations that are not even born yet will look back at our generation and say, what did they do when they found themselves at a crossroad in history? Just like our founding fathers found themselves at a crossroad. What did they do? They chose the side of God and God blessed our nation and God established our nation. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thanks.